Father Peter Hocken, a Catholic priest from England, is a remarkable person. He decided to spend his retirement in Heinburg on the Danube, a town in Austria right on the Slovak border. And here he continues his studies on charismatic renewal and Christian unity, and especially the relationship of Christians with the Jewish people, in particular with Messianic Jews. Next year, in 2017, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. But this is not supposed to remain Catholic only, as Father Peter will explain us in more detail. This is the meeting last week. Well, that's Michel Moran. It was a meeting of people from Icarus and from the Catholic Fraternity. The Pope is being, has, is bringing the Catholic Fraternity and Icarus together. He's told them he, he doesn't want them operating as totally separate, unrelated things. See, um, what's interesting here is that, see, the Pope is, he sits on the same level as everybody else. And See, it says here, he emphasized this is the time of the Spirit. We are expect, experiencing new things of the Spirit. The Holy Father reflected upon how in the past 50 years many things have changed in the Church. He spoke specifically about the ecumenical journey. Pope Francis emphasized that the Holy Spirit has been leading us for many years towards unity. He said the Spirit is asking new things of us and that we should be prepared for the surprises of the Holy Spirit. See, this is all, this is not the traditional. He emphasized that the great jubilee of CCR at Pentecost 2017 must be ecumenical, a time for all Christians, not just for Catholic charismatics. So we need to gather and include all Christians who want to join us. The Holy Father said he will be with us. This is a time when God is preparing something very great. He told us to go forward with courage and to be prepared for the resistance we're going to go through. <laughs> See, the Holy Father entrusted Michel Moran and Pino Scafuro, who's from Buenos Aires, with the mission to work toward establishing one service for one current of grace. We then had an opportunity to pray with the Holy Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to speak about the importance of charismatic movement for Christian unity. I became convinced of the importance of ecumenism. The Lord put unity, Christian unity, on my heart really first in 1955, the year after I was received into the Roman Catholic Church as a young man. So I had a big interest in unity from really 55, and I entered seminary in 58, and within a month of my entering seminary, Pius XII died, and then John XXIII was elected, and three months later he calls the council. And so the whole debate things unleashed by the calling of the council and then the actual event of the council, this was right at the center of my formation. Um, in fact, while I was at seminary and while I was preparing for ordination, it was right at the center because this was what was happening in the Catholic Church. It wasn't in the center of the life of the seminary, um, which <laughs> says something about the not very um, admirable state of the seminary at that time, but um, in fact I was strongly influenced by Vatican II and uh, so I was familiar with all the debates and the moments of crisis, the key turning points, key documents, um, why certain things were added and so on. And I didn't know enough to appreciate the, the deep significance of everything when it was first called, but what I 
I, I realized that, well, I came in touch soon after that, before, um, around those years with a monastery in Belgium that has been committed to work for Christian unity since its foundation in the 1920s. And um, through this and other sources, particularly French sources, I became aware of the things that were important, what was really at stake with the calling of the council, you know, becoming aware that Vatican I was in fact a rather one-sided council that required a, a completion, you know, because it, Vatican I defined things about the Pope and said nothing much about the bishops. And this whole question of the relationship between Pope and bishops, and the Pope as one of the bishops, was right at the center of the debates about the church at Vatican II, and it's come brought right back into the center of the agenda now with Pope Francis, with his new emphasis on synodality and collegiality of Pope and bishops. So, um, you know, the, I was aware of these things being at stake and also um, everything to do with the liturgy because the, the first fruits of the council that impacted the ordinary parish were to do with the liturgy um, and particularly the celebrating the mass in the local language which happened in England for the first time in Advent 64, because the Constitutional Liturgy was voted on at the end of the Council Session 63. And one year later, in many countries, the uh, liturgy began to be celebrated in the local language. They had to make translations and so approved translations. But also, I was very aware of the ecumenical significance of the Council and um, the fact that um, there were observers, for the first time there were observers from other churches at the council. And I followed the debate and everything very carefully and one of my major sources of information was a French journal which doesn't exist anymore called um, Information Catholique Internationale, and um, this had very full reports of everything at the council, and much more than was available in English. And this was a major source of information for me. So um, I was aware of, of the significance of these, but also with this of the ecumenical significance, because all these things, the, the debate on divine revelation, the teaching on scripture and tradition, the, this all had big ecumenical significance, pope relation, pope and bishops, big ecumenical significance, the emphasis on the Bible being accessible to everybody and recommending open access to the text of the Bible for all the baptized, this, these things were all had big ecumenical significance. When I was ordained in 64, I was very much a Vatican II new priest. So I imagined that my ministry would be especially explaining Vatican II to the people. Now, in Could we say that? Well, the, the, there, were, there were many then, there were huge numbers of, of people enthused about the council then. Um, you know, later yeah. there's, a, there's a backlash you against this. You are one of the um, but the new uh, I was, the you know, and there's the different interpretations of, well, of this, um, of what happened after the council, you know. So um, Pope Benedict has, has you know, spoke, you know, the language of the council of the media versus the real council and so on. Um, I think that what I understood then as happening at 
the council and what I was following, I don't think I, this was popular journalism. I, I think that um, some of these journals, like Informational Catholic International, they were not um, sort of gossip journals. There were things coming out that were full of racy stories of what was happening behind the scenes, but um, I don't think that my understanding of the council was shaped by that, and my understanding of what Vatican II was about, um, there's been a continuity in it um, right, right from the time of the council. Vatican II addressed some of the issues that were raised by the, the protest points of Luther and other reformers that were not addressed in the 16th century. Um, yes, the Council of Trent dealt with various abuses and, um, and so on, but what the, for example, the, the, the place of scripture in the life of the church um, w was not addressed at that time in the 16th century. The, um, the whole question of relationship, Pope, Bishop, Synodality, th this was not addressed then. The, with the observers at Vatican II, um, the Orthodox and Protestant observers at Vatican II Many of these wrote books about their experience, about the council, and these were not at all a council of the media. The, the, these were serious reflections from people who immediately saw the historical importance of what was happening. And so I think it's true to say that at, at Vatican II, the Catholic Church began to examine seriously for the first time questions that had been raised by the reformers and were not addressed really in, in, in a constructive way in, in before. Um, and this, one of the Protestant observers were, were highly conscious of this. Now, but coming back to Meisner, I was, I said, I understood that when I was ordained, I would be going out to explain the council I, as a young priest, that, and this was mentality was part of a widespread attitude at that time was that the, the church would be renewed through renewed theology. You know, the, the, I, the, I bought into this, I accepted this view. And this was what, what the charismatic renewal began to change in me because there was little place for the Holy Spirit in this. It was a whole view of the church is renewed through theology being renewed, which means being changed in some way. And, um, but there's not much place for the Holy Spirit in that. And so I found when I was first ordained, in fact, this was providential, I'm sure, my bishop sent me to an industrial town which, where there were very few people with any higher education. In the parish I was, they were almost all factory workers in, the in, England. in England, where I was sent when I was first ordained. And trying to explain Vatican II to these people was a total waste of time. I mean, you, you wouldn't even start hardly because it's, they don't think like that. So this was an important lesson for me. But I think I only found the answer to this when I came in touch with the renewal in 71 because then I experienced the Holy Spirit and the change that the Holy Spirit brings, the light that the Holy Spirit brings, so that it's not just um, the work of theologians um, reinterpreting doctrine and, and opening up subjects and rethinking doctrines, but it is a question of the light of the Holy Spirit uh, and the illumination of the Spirit of divine revelation illuminated by the Spirit that corrects distorted views of interpretation of Scripture and so on. And so um, from this point, my understanding 
the importance of renewal for me, and I think this has an application for the whole church, the, the importance of charismatic renewal for me was that it showed me what real renewal means. Previously, I'd been excited about renewal because Pope John called the council as a council of renewal, but I was thinking renewal means this is what's done by theolo theologians. And, um, and in this view also, you tend to think of theologians as the real agents of renewal and bishops as more often obstacles, um, <laughs> which is not a helpful way of thinking. I knew from my experience with the council that ecumenism belonged to the renewal of the church. There cannot be a renewal, an authentic renewal has to be ecumenical. And in fact, this is stated in the Decree on Ecumenism. In paragraph six of the Decree on Ecumenism, it says this, that um, ecumenism requires conversion, it, you know, it, it, renewal and reform are all essential elements in ecumenism. And so, you know, I knew this from the council, ecumenism belongs to the renewal of the church. So the kind of uh, traditionalist, very conservative Catholic approaches today m among some people that are, have no ecumenical interest or dimension, this cannot be in line with the Second Vatican Council. Um, the, then, uh, in my experience of renewal, it was immediately an ecumenical experience or an experience with other Christians because the charismatic renewal did not begin in the Catholic Church. And so right in the first years of renewal among, charismatic renewal among Catholics, there were many Catholics who were being baptized in the Spirit through contact with other Christians, whether Protestant charismatics or Pentecostals. The charismatic movement did not have any one point of origin. I think it is best understood as the, the, the same grace that was poured out at the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, for which Azusa Street is a Los Angeles is a central symbol that this same grace, same gift to the Spirit, were being poured out on other Christians, received by other Christians who were not Pentecostals and who um, believed they should stay in the church's denominations they were already in. They, they, they did not have the view that being baptized in the Spirit meant they left their church and became Pentecostals, even though that was what some Pentecostals expected. Uh, so um, the, it did not begin in any one place. There were several contributory elements in the origin of the charismatic movement. First was, was um, ministry of Pentecostals who um, who had a ministry sort of beyond Pentecostal denominations. Um, uh, one example of this was the Full Gospel Businessmen, who was originally founded by a Pentecostal layman and for reaching other businessmen. And this was not tied to a Pentecostal denomination. And many people from other churches um, heard about baptism of the spirits, the gifts of the Spirit, so on, through the Full Gospel Businessmen. And the Full Gospel Businessmen encouraged, they often invited uh, pastors, Protestant pastors, to th their breakfast they organized and other meetings. So this, uh, there was something like that. Then there were, there were healing evangelists, a number, some Pentecostals, but the, the healing evangelists of the 1950s and 60s 
especially in the United States, were not looked on very favorably by the Pentecostal denominations. But they reached all kinds of people because when people are sick and hoping for healing, they go anywhere where they think there's a hope of healing. And so there were a lot of people, including a lot of Catholics, who, who went to these meetings of the healing evangelists. And this was another cause that way in which this began to, uh, what you might call Pentecostal blessing and phenomena began to spread outside the Pentecostal denominations. In, in some places, and this was true in England, there were, there were groups of evangelical Christians praying for revival. You know, revival has always been a key theme of ev evangelicals. And so evangelicals are praying for revival. They're always hoping for another revival and um, tell the stories of the last big revival and so on. And so the, um, there were groups started to, for praying for revival in many places. In England, there, there, was, the, the, there was an Anglican fellowship prayer for revival. There was a Baptist revival fellowship. There was a Methodist revival fellowship and so on. And in, some of the, in these groups of people praying for revival, there were several instances of people who began without expecting it to pray in tongues. And this was another, these were circles where, where charismatic phenomena began and th this played a part in the beginnings of the charismatic movement. So the, the, there were a whole lot, the, there were prayer for revival, there were people discovering. Now there were also people rediscovering healing ministry in, the, in a way quite separate from Pentecostal charismatic movement, especially among Anglicans, but there were also others. And also this was true in Switzerland, reformed and so There were people who were discovering healing again, um, of prayer for healing. And of course, you know, the, because this has such a prominent place in the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus, this, you know, this, this was nothing to do with Pentecostal movement, a charismatic thing. There were people who were rediscovering healing, opening houses of healing, um, having healing ministries. And, um, and so as the charismatic movement began, several of these people in healing ministry began to discover that healing was actually one of the charisma to in 1 Corinthians. And, and, and then, but there were other charisma to prophecy and so on. And so they, uh, there were people who were already praying for healing in a more traditional way, not in a charismatic way, who through that, was a door for them into a charismatic dimension. So there were many contributing elements in the beginning of the charismatic movement. There was no one place, there was no Azusa Street. Not that, uh, there's a big debate among Pentecost. Pentecost it, Azusa Street isn't the only place where Pentecost moved, but, but it is the most important, significant place and influential. There was no place that corresponded to that in the charismatic movement. And, um, but um, the movement, in fact, there were a lot of examples in the 1950s, but, the, but that was not widely known. But it was 1960 when this became a headline in some journals. Um, because in 1960, there was an Episcopal priest, Anglican in the United States, Dennis Bennett, near Los Angeles, who began to pray in tongues. And he announced this publicly one Sunday in May 1960. And, th and then this led to he, he was suspended by his bishop. Um, and there was some news in Los Angeles. But what really m made this known, widespread, was there was a woman 
in that in his parish who who was um, also baptized in the spirit, who was a zealous um, promoter and um, and she she contacted it's interesting this she contacted Time magazine with this story um, and and Time magazine didn't think it was important so they didn't publish anything about it but um, but so then she goes to Newsweek the other and Newsweek did publish a story on it and um, and this through the but then Time magazine realized they'd made a mistake. And so they had a story on all of this soon after the Newsweek story. But between them, those two things drew big attention to this emergence of like Episcopalians, Anglicans speaking in tongues and prophesying and so on. And so from this point, 1960, there was um, an awareness of this current because then it became known that there were others who were already speaking in tongues. After, from 1960, you began to get um, denominations, first in the United States, Protestant denominations, that felt they had to respond to this. Was this a good thing, a bad thing? And so you begin to get official denominational statements either about charismatic movement or about speaking in tongues. 